So I'd like to begin by saluting Kai Hai and Canada Health InfoWay for coming together in, in a very special way uh, as, as a partnership, uh, demonstrating what we're about to sp uh, speak to this evening. Um, I'd also like to harken back, I think it was David O'Toole that kicked off the session this afternoon by, by pointing out correctly that Canada once did own the podium when it came to health and health care. There wasn't a time very long ago, back when I was still at Health and Welfare Canada, we would have people from around the world coming to Canada asking for the, what's the magic sauce, right? We even had Hillary Clinton, right, back in 1995 come and, and ask, how is it that Canada spends so little and gets so much? Well, fast forward, a few weeks ago, I had some folks in from uh, Iceland, and they were asking a different question. They were asking, how is it that Canada spends so much and has drifted so far down those league tables? So this, I think tonight's uh, the, the discussion this evening in, in terms of owning the podium is all about how, how can we work together, partner, to get us back up on top, to get us back in the top tercile of health-performing nations in the world. And so uh, we have uh, two special guests uh, this evening. Uh, but before we, uh, we uh, introduce them, my understanding is that there's a, there's a, a tape that we, uh, we'd all, uh, I think, quite enjoy uh, to kick off the discussions. Massive national celebration and outpouring of patriotism continues. I think it's appropriate that one week ago, as we reached the midway point of these games, Stephen Brunt of the Globe and Mail brought us in a video essay. You might remember, he described a feeling that was emerging in this country, a momentum that even a litany of early Olympic problems could not stop. How hosting the world was bringing into focus just who we are as a nation. Well, now that the games are ending and you can hear the celebrations, we asked Stephen for his final thoughts on what the last 17 days have meant to this country. Let's be honest, it didn't start out very well. A tragic death on day one. An embarrassing malfunction at the worst possible moment of the Olympic opening ceremonies. The snow melting away on Cypress Mountain. The cauldron crudely fenced off from those who wanted to bask in its glow. It seemed like Canada's Olympics might not recover from that stumbling start. And that was before we realized it wasn't going to be quite so easy to own the podium. And Charles Amelin will not move on. Before the crushing pressure to perform at home shattered the confidence of some of Canada's best medal hopes. It's really hard. I feel like I've let my entire country down. But even as those inside the Olympic bubble were fretting and wringing their hands, on the outside, on the streets, and not just here in Vancouver and Whistler, but right across Canada, something remarkable was taking place. It was as though an entire country was given permission to feel something it needed to feel. And it was the country that set the tone for these games, and not the other way around. A sense that began with the torch relay and kept right on building. He has done it! Even after Alexander Bilodeau's victory, the historic first gold medal, and those unforgettable images of him with his brother, it wasn't quite the script we were expecting. The story was supposed to be all about winning, about finishing first, about putting a new swagger in our step. Turns out, the swagger was already there. It was just waiting for the right stage. Montgomery takes gold in skeleton! And by the time John Montgomery made his famous stroll through the streets of Whistler, all of Canada was walking beside him, reaching for that pitcher of beer. The number of medals didn't really matter. Though, in the end, the number's going to be just fine. We didn't really need to own anything. What mattered was the occasion. What mattered was the event. What mattered was the excuse to wave the flag and sing the anthem and shout it out loud. Cynicism is easy. 
So is retreating into historic grudges. So is looking at a world in which what were once borders are now dotted lines at best, and believing it doesn't really matter what you call yourself, or where you live. It does matter, or at least it can. It is important to have a shared history. There is power in the collective experience. And admit it, it feels good. It feels good to let your heart show. An essay by Globe and Mail columnist Stephen Brunt. Now, as I watch that, I think back, uh, many of you people probably saw it, the interview with Prime Minister Harper last night. I said to the Prime Minister, I said, there's something happening in this country. I've been to 13 Olympics. I've never seen it. What do you think it is? And he said much like Stephen said this afternoon. He said, the patriotism and pride has always been there. This country was simply waiting for an opportunity to show it. Vancouver has provided that opportunity, and that will forever be the legacy of these 2010 Winter Olympics. The patriotism and pride's always been there in Canada's health and health care system, too. And this might be the turning point to get us back up on top. And we have the special privilege this evening of having two, uh, two guests uh, that will help share the secret sauce of getting atop the podium, owning the podium this evening, and it's my pleasure to introduce both of them. So the first is uh, Anne Merklinger. She's Chief Executive Officer of Own the Pro uh, Podium. She's uh, an elite athlete in her own regard, uh, um, uh, as a swimmer first, and when I got to know her as a curler. And by the way, if, uh, if the Merklingers were to form a team, uh, they, they would own the podium in terms of <laughs> curling because uh, Dave, one of her brothers, and Bill are, are also excellent curlers. Um, and, um, and, and Anne is, uh, has had a lifelong experience and, uh, and had, has had a lifelong experience with uh, elite sports and, and, as I say, is the CEO of the Own the Podium. Our second guest is, uh, or our speaker is uh, Paul Robinson, the Associate Vice President, Credit Risk Management with Canadian Tire. And again, Paul's had a, a long and distinguished career in management and, and senior leadership positions. But I wanted to share, th February is heart month, right? Everybody knows that? I was appointed as uh, CEO of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada in February or January of 1995. And one of the things that I looked, I saw, one of the first things I saw as a CEO was the fact that corporate donations to the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada were going down, and not by a little bit, by a lot. So we came down to Toronto, my president, or the chair of the board and I, and we, we wanted to meet with several of our big donors and find out what was happening. And one of the first ones was Canadian Tire. And Canadian Tire had been giving the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And it, it started to go down gradually and then went to zero. And so I went in and spoke to the senior VP of philanthropic giving and I said, so how would you describe the relationship between Canada Tire, Canadian Tire and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada? He said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we've been sending you hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years and we sometimes get a letter of thanks and sometimes don't get a letter of thanks. And it took it, us going to zero to have somebody like you show up to ask why. And I says, so why? He said, the definition of partnering can't be, we want you to part with your money. <laughs> and so out of that, I came back, I said, would you agree to meet in another month? And I said, what's really important to Can uh, Canadian Tire? And he said, sports and kids. And we came back about six weeks later with a proposal for Heart Smart Kids that converted into Jumpstart and we started to get the money going back the other direction because we stopped and said it's not just about the exchange of money. So I think what you're about here tonight is that partnering is much more than people parting with money. It's sharing a vision 
uh, and sharing, a, uh, and, and sharing a, a, an objective. So I'd like to uh, invite Anne to come forward and share her thoughts with us. Anne. I must tell you, Bill, uh, mixed doubles is a new Olympic curling event, so I might, when I'm finished tonight, pick up the phone and call one of the two of them. They're both older than, than me, so I remind them of that often, but uh, I, I must say, when I watch the Stephen Brunt video, um, you, you will know that I have the greatest job in the world. There is nothing that um, I think about every day than trying to help Canada's athletes and coaches get on the podium. And when we see the uh, Canadian flag um, climb the, the mast and we sing national or sing our national anthem. It really is uh, something that drives us each and every day. Um, the Stephen Brunt video really brings back some terrific memories from Vancouver and I hope that each and every one of you here this evening can recall where you were when Crosby scored the goal or whatever m memory you have out of uh, Canada hosting the games. There are many to share. Paul and I are absolutely delighted to be here this evening. I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. I don't usually speak in, in front of um, a room full of health professionals, so, uh, but truly uh, privileged to be here. And I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of history around On the Podium. We, um, prior to Vancouver, Canada hosted two sets of games. Uh, the first was in uh, the Summer Olympic Games were in Montreal in 1976, and then we hosted the uh, Olympic Winter Games in Calgary in 1988. And as you can see, we did not win a gold medal in either one of those games. And we are the only nation, the only nation, that failed to win a gold medal in the two sets of games that we hosted. Not the kind of bragging rights, I'm a proud Canadian, but we are not bragging about our performance in those two sets of games. So then, um, in 2005, uh, the International Olympic Committee awarded the Games to Vancouver, the um, Olympic and Paralympic Games, to Vancouver. And Van Ock, at the time, as you, you saw John Furlong on the Stephen Brunt video, he was the CEO and chair of the Vancouver Olympic Games, the organizing committee. And he believed that the only way the Games would be successful is if the Canadian team performed well. So, um, probably in the first time, and you, you talk about the leaders in the, in the health sector coming together and, and you know, determining what your game changers are. All of the uh, winter sport leaders in Canada came together with all levels of government and invested $110 million over five years to launch the Own the Podium program. And our goal was to finish first in Vancouver, to own the podium, a rather bold and audacious goal and not something that we as humble Canadians typically do. So we. We were terrified. <laughs> I wasn't with the organization at the time. I was working in summer sport. I worked in Canoe Kayak Canada for a long time, but certainly um, watched from afar as this um, initiative on the podium started to work its magic. And it, it worked. On February 10th, almost uh, actually, uh, you know, we're almost on, on the anniversary of when Alexandre Bilodeau won Canada's first gold medal in freestyle moguls first gold medal on home snow or soil. Canada went on to win 14 gold medals in Vancouver, and we did finish first in the gold medal tally. We owned the podium in, in gold medals. We won the most gold medals in the history of the Olympic Winter Games. So still, to this, to this day, we're, we're uh, very proud of that accomplishment. We also, in the Paralympic Games, Canada won 10 gold medals and 19 medals in total. And we finished third in both of those, and that again was uh, Canada's best performance ever in the Winter Paralympic Games. And the Games were a tremendous success. On the heels of the conclusion of the Games, the Government of Canada announced that they would sustain the investment for the On the Podium program, and in fact they expanded it to both Summer Olympic and Paralympic sports. Our mandate is crystal clear. Every day we wake up, we come to work, and we think, how are we going to help Canada win more medals? Every, we de every decision that we make is based on, is this going to help Canada's athletes and medals, athletes and coaches win more medals? We are guided by um, a handful of uh, funding principles, and they're entrenched in our brains, uh, and one of them is uh, we take what we call a top-down approach, a top-down targeted approach in developing our investment recommendations. Sports are assessed from a technical perspective, and technical really is, in, well, in our language, from a high-performance sport perspective. 
based on their potential to win medals at um, the upcoming set of games and the subsequent set of games. Those sports with the potential to win the highest number of medals are ranked at the top of the list and they're allocated first and foremost in our funding recommendations. And we go down the list. And if you don't have the potential to win a medal, guess what? You're not on the list. And they don't like us. The ones that aren't on the list, they don't receive the incremental funding recommendation. But our mandate is so clear, you have to have evidence of podium potential to be on the list. Another important funding principle for us is multiple medal sports are the number one priority. In looking at the profile of the top nations, it's really clear in both the Olympic and Paralympic Games, summer and winter, all the top nations have a handful of sports that win three, four, five, six, seven medals. And they're what we call kind of the bread and butter sports. Freestyle skiing won seven medals in Sochi, so they were at the top of the list for Canada. And we're just under 180 days away from the eve, uh, the start of the Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. And athletics heads into the Games, so the sport of athletics heads into the Games as one of Canada's top multiple medal prospects. Uniquely for Canada, we, um, we invest uh, in Olympic and Paralympic Games. And very few nations will invest in both Olympic and Paralympic Games. And we also invest in summer and winter. So it's quite a broad scope, even though it's quite narrow in terms of helping more athletes and coaches win medals. We've got four big sets of games that are important to, to Canada. Some of you might say, well, why does it matter if we win medals? You know, do we really want to spend taxpayers' money, public money, in helping Canada win more medals? We're asked that question often, and apart from what you witnessed in the Stephen Brunt video, every Games creates a whole new generation of heroes, a whole new generation of role models that can come back to our communities, your communities, and inspire Canadians to lead healthier lives, be more active, and encourage them to climb their own podium, whatever that might look like. Every Medal One is a vehicle for developing a healthier population more active communities, and a prouder, stronger, and more united nation. And I think we've, we have witnessed that uh, since Vancouver. Another critical decision-making uh, principle for Own the Podium is that we focus on future medal potential. So some sports might have won medals in the past. That doesn't matter. It's an investment in the future. We, it, is, it is not a, um, a reward for past performance, it's an award for future performance. And this is where it gets tough. Because our job is to identify athletes that, have, that we have assessed to have future podium potential. And the only way to do that for our organization is to have an objective, evidence-based approach. That's not easy. We can't rely on sport organizations telling us that athlete A or athlete B is tracking for a medal performance. We need to have the evidence to show that they are truly tracking for a medal performance. Frankly, a sales pitch isn't good enough. That's what Canada used to do. We also used to sp spread the money a mile wide and an inch deep, and we were close to the bottom of the medal ranking table. So the approach has been dramatically different since On the Podium was created. We're entrusted with $64 million of public money annually to be invested in sports that have athletes with evidence of podium potential. Making decisions based on that evidence will, and we've, we've seen it, it's working, will yield a greater return on investment and ultimately Canada will, will win more medals. So this is where data analytics comes in for us in terms of uh, being able to make evidence-based decisions. We're swamped with data, literally drowning in data. We have results from every Canadian athlete in every sport in, for the last 10 to 20 years. We have results from every international athlete in every country in every sport for the last 10 to 20 years or longer. Our challenge is to use this data to help us identify those athletes that are truly tracking for a podium performance five to eight years in the future. We need to use this data so that we can, so that we actually have the evidence and we can help sports themselves 
develop that evidence as well. Ultimately, the data, using the data effectively helps us to make better decisions, more informed decisions. Winning medals in the international arena is big business. It's, it's hard. We are up against nations that are investing two to three, four, five times as much dollars in their budget for high performance sport than what Canada is. As I mentioned, we're also one of the few countries that looks at Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, summer and winter. Lots of nations, because of their climate or a greater importance on the Olympic Games, are not investing in either Paralympics or winter or summer. We're doing all four. We also, as a nation, have some other unique challenges. We're a big country, so it takes a long time to fly from one, one coast to the other coast. If you live in Europe, you can drive from one competition to the next competition in a different country. That's not our reality, so it costs more. Our summer sport athletes have to relocate in the middle of the winter to, to be able to train for three to four months. Canada's sport leaders are constantly trying to do more with less. While it's $64 million, it hasn't changed since 2010. So we know, all know what that means in terms of um, you know, dollars not being indexed. What does this mean for OTP and our quest to help athletes and coaches win more medals? Three things. Firstly, it, need, it means we need to make better decisions than our competitors. More informed decisions those that are based on evidence. Secondly, it means that we need to be more resourceful, more creative, more innovative than our competitors. And finally, it means, it means we need to develop partnerships that can help us in every element of our business. So let's talk a little bit about partnerships because that's why Paul and I are, are here today. OTP's partnership with Canadian Tire Bank is truly a game changer for Canada's athletes and coaches. We've partnered with a company that is passionate about high performance sport and passionate about helping Canada's athletes and coaches win more medals. Canadian Tire has not only provided financial support for OTP, they've provided the expertise, the brains, the data scientists who are working with OTP and the national sport organizations to help all of us make better decisions, decisions that are based on evidence. Decisions that will help Canada's future Olympic and Paralympic champions. I'm delighted to pass the baton in the spirit of sport over to Paul. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate that. Um, so I'll make a couple commitments to you from the get-go. Uh, there'll be no math. So I am going to show a few graphs, but I'll be light on the math. And uh, the second commitment is I will make a prediction. So you can hold me to that prediction at the end. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of background on our partnership, give you a little bit of background about Canadian Tire and Canadian Tire Bank, and then I'd like to tell you a few stories about some of the work that we've done with On the Podium. So at Canadian Tire, we have a very proud sports heritage. Uh, we're very overt about meaning all things sports to Canadians. We try and own sports. Uh, you'll see our tagline, we all play for Canada. And we sing that not only in our advertising and communications, but we sing it internally as well. And that really starts with the associations that we form partnerships with. And uh, first and foremost, it starts with Jumpstart, which is our organization to help children, under, uh, needy children, be able to play sports and get in the game. And as of last year in 2015, we crossed the million child mark where we've helped a million, million children in Canada get in sport that otherwise would not have the ability to do that. And then we've extended those, that partnership across many different sports organizations, starting with um, the Olympics, Canadian Olympic Committee and on the podium, and Canadian Paralympic Committee, to the NHL uh, and Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, and the Habs, as Bill said, three game streak. So I'm very happy as a big Habs fan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then along with the national sports organizations as well. Uh, and we, transcend all sports. Like I said, we want Canadians, when they think sport, to think Canadian Tire. So again, as my first passion is, I'm a bit of a piston head, so I'm very happy that we're involved in NASCAR and that we have the Canadian Tire Motorsports Park just north of the city in Bowmanville. And then we've got our ambassadors as well. And um, these folks, our athlete ambassadors, deliver tremendous value to us. They give us um, great credibility in this space. 
I mean, I have to tell you, as an employee, when you hear things like, we just signed Wayne Gretzky to be an ambassador for Canadian Tire, nothing will make you more proud as an employee to hear words like that. And you can see some of the athletes we have here. And, and I was telling Anne a bit of a story today. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend the event. Um, but to show how pervasive the sport culture is at Canadian Tire, they had Scotty Bowman come and talk to 200 people today. And for those of you that don't know, he is uh, the winningest coach in NHL history. And he's won uh, the Stanley Cup 14 times. And for Canadian Tire to bring people like him and Mark Messier and Rick Hansen, they come in and they talk to us about leadership and what it, what it means to lead a team, what it means to contribute to others and contribute to the community. It's a fantastic environment to work in. So what do a bunch of bankers know about sports analytics anyway? And if you can't read the caption, it says, a stock market fell sharply today, then bounced back, spiraled upwards, jumped forward, leapt to new heights, tumbled rapidly, and took first place in a gymnastics competition, which is pretty accurate for the market lately, for those of you that follow the market. So um, really, the way I'll answer that, because it, it's probably not obvious how Canadian Tire, especially Canadian Tire Bank, is doing sports analytics. So. Uh, the partnership started off, there's uh, a senior executive on Canadian Tire, at Canadian Tire, our chief marketing officer, uh, Duncan Fulton, who is on the board with, um, with Anne and on the podium. And Anne, during one of their board meetings, said, listen, you know, we really would like to get into data analytics. And Duncan recognized that us at Canadian Tire Bank were heavy into data analytics. And so from there, it germinated into the partnership we've had, which is about 18 months old now. Uh, what I would say about Canadian Tire Bank, in fact, I talked to a few people out in the hallway who were surprised to hear Canadian Tire has a bank. We do. We're uh, the second largest MasterCard issuer in Canada. So we have $5 billion in receivables on our MasterCard. We have about 4 million active customers that use our MasterCard in our stores and everywhere else that MasterCard's accepted. Um, Canadian Tire Bank started uh, in the 60s as a financing company for customers that would go into a Canadian Tire store. And Joe Smith would come into the store, he would know the dealer because each of our stores is dealer owned and strike a relationship up with the dealer and the dealer would extend credit to that individual. But the dealer was not in the business of managing credit, so they had outsourced that to uh, this little company in Welland called Midland Credit. And eventually uh, Midland Credit's business became predominantly Canadian Tire and Canadian Tire bought Midland Credit in the 60s. And since then we've grown into the company we are today. But early on, what we realized was if we were going to compete with banks and other people that issue credit that have much deeper pockets than us and have much more clout than we do, we needed a competitive advantage. And we recognized that competitive advantage was data and how we could use data differently. We lend to what I call um, underbanked and those with little or no credit history. So a bit of a story, about 10 years ago, we started to do data analytics and said, what do we have that other banks don't have? So when you purchase something in a Canadian Tire store and you put it on your Canadian Tire credit card, not only do I have the transactional information about what time it was, where it was, how much you spent, but because it was in a Canadian Tire store, we also have what you bought. So we have your basket. And what we did was we started to correlate the credit risk behavior of individuals with what was in their basket. And if you look at things like motor oil, we sell about 10 different brands of motor oil, and credit risk is directly correlated with uh, the expense of the motor oil. So Mobile One motor oil, which is very expensive motor oil, it's for synthetic engines, all the BMWs your doctors drive, runs on Mobile One. Um, and it shows basically that this individual uh, respects their things, is willing to spend money on good things. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, if you buy no-name motor oil, or even worse, a stop gunk, which is something that will save your engine, hopefully, for a few more thousand kilometers, directly correlated to the credit risk of the individual, you're a much more risky individual. So that's a long story to say, we've taken that sort of foray into analytics, and we've tried to parlay it through all of our business. And um, we've had innovations uh, that have been recognized through industry leaders and through our peers, quite frankly, through industry associations. We get together, like you guys do in this room, uh, for credit management. And we've uh, won accolades from the industry. And so the point of the story is we're pretty good at risk management and we're well recognized as being good at risk management, despite the fact that we're a small bank. 
and it was um, maybe not so natural at first blush, but natural to those of us that know how analytics work, that on the podium would come to us and talk to us about whether we'd like to help them out with this. It was still daunting, to be honest with you, and we were quite nervous about it, but we think we've delivered some pretty good results so far. So to talk about sports analytics, how we actually do it, Anne mentioned podium pathway. So really that is our end goal, is we want to deliver a tool and some mathematics to sports so that they can work with their athletes to understand is an athlete on the right path for a podium pathway or not. And the podium pathway is essentially three components. It's um, sport high performance targets. So this looks at where's the sport going in and of itself. So there's no point in predicting a winning time of a sport of say it'll take a minute for this particular sport for a winning time if every year previous to that a minute was being shaved off of the winning time and that difference is exponential in the past. So you have to have a viewpoint on where's the sport going? How, how, how much uh, improvement are we seeing in that sport's results on a year over year basis through world championships and world cups? So you have a sport view, but then you also have an individual performance view as well. You have to say, you as an individual, how are you tracking relative to others that have been on the podium, that are in the same age group as you, that are at the same time you were at in the present? So in other words, four years out, are you getting the placements that you should be getting uh, that the person who actually won the medal was getting? And the third component is benchmarks. At the end of the day, there's still a probability associated with all the, these elements that says, are you in the hunt or not? So in other words, a year out, uh, and here, here's a good example. So for um, world championships, 73% uh, of men and 83% of women uh, medalists um, what were in the top six of a world championship the year before the Olympics occurred in, um, in uh, what sport was that? Cycling, in cycling. So it just says, you know what, if you're in the top 20 the year before, the likelihood of you actually getting on the podium is very slim. But if you're in the top six, it's a very good chance. And if you're in the top eight, you've got spitting distance, you know, go for it. So we take all those three, three things together and we build a podium pathway. And that's based on a lot of projections, a lot of performance metrics, and historical trajectories. And that's the analysis that we're doing now for On the Podium. All that analysis only comes about through good data. And data is the uh, uh, cornerstone of any of the analytics that we perform. We need good data. And Anne had a very nice uh, graphic up there that probably was not representative of the actual data that we've been working with because it's really ugly data. So, and um, she's right in that there's a lot of it, so it's big data, but we call it big ugly data. Uh, and we've probably, in, we've worked on about eight or 10 sports. We've dealt with at least 100 different form factors of data and trying to get data into a relational format so that it can be analyzed. Um, some of the things we've come across is uh, PDFs, uh, and not only PDFs, which are hard to machine read, um, but even from event to, to event, year over year, the format of the PDF will change. In some years, there'll be three rows per uh, time event. In other years, there'll be two rows. Very messy data. When we first started out doing this, the way we got around that was we hired a lot of cheap students that keyed in data from source, basically. And then we realized that that was not sustainable. And so I uh, got some really smart guys in my team and they built a tool from scratch that will go and climb through the data and it will actually learn the format of the data and be able to read it in to a CSV or a SAS database uh, in a relational format once you actually input what the data um, structure looks like. So, uh, this is one of those areas where, you know, it builds, what's the, what's the power of the partnership? Absolutely right here. This is something that we were not doing previously, and it's transcended into other areas of our business where we can use tools like this to gather data more effectively and more easily. So kudos to my guys. I clearly hired the right guys because they were, I was blown away when they, uh, when they showed me how they had done this. So once we have that data, generally you should be able to predict something with that data. And again, we're trying to predict winning times, we're trying to predict ath athlete trajectories. Um, and here's some example, uh, track cycling gold medal times. Um, and it looks at world championships over a number of years. 
This is for women's. And you can see, you know what, there's, there's probably a trend there. You can easily draw a trend line to say what's going to happen in 14 and 15. It's going to be probably sub 320 seconds. The challenge is, is that the format of the event changed. So track cycling went from three riders to four riders, and it went from three kilometers to four kilometers. So that's a big problem if you're trying to predict who's going to be on the podium when you've only got essentially two data points. So again, uh, smart analysts, they actually started to pull apart each of those events, those prior events, and looked at um, the relationship between the cumulative race time at splits within the race so that we could essentially traject if those events would have been longer in the four kilometer range, what would have happened. And essentially, we can backwards project that data so that we can reset it so that it is comparable over time. And then we're able to actually predict a result that can be effective and say, here's what you need to achieve to get on the podium in Rio. Now, interestingly, um, you know, with this business, it's very transparent on whether you're doing well at your predictions or not. Um, and so this one, thankfully, uh, we were within a second of a world championship time earlier this year, earlier in 2015, after we built the model this way. So we, we uh, were pretty effective at predicting that time. So not only uh, does um, the data structure matter, but the context matters. And this is really important too, when you're looking at uh, um, different um, sporting um, events over time. So two races here, two rowing races. You can see in the first picture, um, clearly a team has won and a team has come in second, but there is a bit of a skin of the teeth on that picture. And the second team, second picture, they've whooped them, right? And so it's important to understand not only who won, but how they won. And so we've come up with something that we're coining a uh, performance score. And it lets us look at taking out, uh, it lets us look at how the race or the event transpired and how well the athlete did or the team did relative to everyone else within the field. And what it does is it allows us to take out bias of things like weather. So if it's raining during one of these events, it's likely going to be a lot slower. If you're trying to build a podium pathway, you have to take into account those things. So we convert everything to a performance score that basically takes out the ordinal nature of finishing first, second, and third. And we look at relative to everyone else in the field, how did the athletes do on that particular day? So um, it's been, uh, it, again, one of those breakthroughs for us. I think it's adding a lot of value. It started in rowing, but we're transcending that sort of performance score metric to other areas like cycling and like canoe kayak. Ann talked about um, funding decisions and how you decide um, with evidence who you're going to support and who maybe you're not going to support as much. So here's a bit of a story for mountain bike and two athletes. So athlete A and B, um, and, and frankly the coach was talking up athlete A and saying, you know what, athlete A's um, our, our hope, where we're going to be, athlete B is a good athlete, um, but they're very different, different age groups, different times from podium. And uh, that's the metric on the bottom is years to podium. So one is younger than the other. And when we lay on how those athletes should be performing, knowing that the podium uh, is coming up with the Olympics, when we layer that on, we can see athlete A is actually not performing to the standard he needs to if he's actually going to medal in the Olympics. So th two and three years out, he's not meeting the benchmark performance he needs to meet versus athlete B is actually exceeding so they will be on the podium at the pace that they're at. So this allows the sports and the coaches to, I would say, refocus their efforts on the appropriate um, individuals that are more likely to deliver those medals for us. Uh, in addition, we'll look at things like uh, some of the analytics we've done help us understand and, and talked about, you know, where, where do we want to go next? We, there are other sports we aspire to do well in. And one of them is men's cycling team pursuit. And um, the sport there asks us to profile the biggies in that sport. And that's the, the Brits, uh, the New Zealanders, the Australians, and the up-and-comers are the Colombians. And so we were able to create metrics to show when the Australians did well and when the Brits did well, here's what their performance looked like years prior to the Olympics. And you can see we're on the end there. We're eight or nine years away from a podium pathway, but now the sport knows what it needs to achieve in order to look and emulate the success that the other teams had. 
So it's another tool that we've given to those sports to help them uh, further develop their, their program so that they can try and get on the podium. The last example I'll show you, a uh, real tangible one, and uh, this, the, the, Anne's eyes lit up when I talked to her about this uh, the last time we were together, and this is luge. So luge is interesting in that there's always been this um, uh, sort of connection that how well you start is correlated to how well you finish. It makes sense. But the Luge Canada folks uh, did not have the ability to prove that hypothesis. And we were able to pull together a lot of past data and show essentially that start time, so the time between the Luge um, uh, starting and the first timing uh, bracket uh, has a three to one payback ratio. So for every uh, one unit of improvement, so one hundredths of improvement, you're three hundredths better in terms of time by the time you finish the race. And so absolutely um, the luge folks have taken this and said, here's our evidence and here's why we need to focus. And they can use it with their athletes as well and say, you know what, you're not very good at a start. You're a great racer but you need to work on your starting position because here's the results it can deliver. So more evidence we can deliver for them to, to help on the podium. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up. Um, what I'd say is a, a couple of things. Um, for us, there's, I would say, two benefits. Uh, there's multiple benefits, but two ways I'd summarize the benefits of working with um, Own the Podium. There's macro and micro. From a selfish point of view, I have 35 analysts that work on credit risk management. We have a $300 million write-off budget that we need to manage. And then uh, what this does for us is it gives my analysts another area to be proficient in, in terms of discipline. Whenever you have a group of large people together, just like this, there's a lot of sports heads in the group. And so when we started this, we had more demand than, we had more supply than demand in terms of people that wanted to be on this team. So now I have another discipline that helps me keep analysts, keep them engaged, learning new techniques and new methodologies, and transcending those learnings into our other business around credit risk management. So from a selfish perspective, I'm very happy about that. But from more of a macro perspective, when I talked about how Canadian Tire means, wants to mean sports to every Canadian, um, you know, really we want to harness that patriotic pride. We want to help athletes achieve the pinnacle of success and get to that podium. So one last thing I'll close on, um, and that is, you know, doing all this work, people will say, well, what do you think about Rio, right? And so a couple of predictions. So here's what I'll say. In August, when you're on your boat dock or in your living room and you're watching the Olympics, you think back, if this came true, you can think back of what the geniuses at Canadian Tire told you. <laughs> and if not, I hope you've forgotten my name so you won't remember, all right? So uh, two predictions we're gonna make. Um, first prediction is that um, seven out of 26 um, world records will be broken uh, for swimming at Rio. So that's interesting because we try and predict what's gonna happen with the sport. We think there's gonna be huge advancements in swimming at Rio. And then secondarily, at an athlete level, uh, Anne mentioned it, and we've got the data to back it up, that we're very, very bullish about a lot of our athletics uh, uh, athletes. And uh, we predict that Damian Warner in decathlon, Andre de, de Grasse in sprint, Sean Barber in pole vault, and Brian Thiessen Eaton in heptathlon will all be on the podium. So that's our prediction. We're, we're gonna just end with a, a really nice video that's uh, basically a, a summary of our press release from about a year, year and a half ago that um, Mark Tewksbury uh, talks at, and it just talks about the power of data and analytics and what the relationship means between the two organizations. So we'll end on that note. I'm really excited to be here today for this special announcement between Canadian Tire Corporation and Own the Podium. Canadian Tire and Own the Podium have agreed to a three-year partnership where Canadian Tire's data analytics team have added sports analytics to their workload. We'll be working hard to provide Own the Podium with actionable insights that will help shape decisions on where money is invested to win more medals for Canada. It's not good enough to have the world's best time this year. You need to be able to predict how fast you need to go in 2016, 
2018, 2022 and beyond. Canadian Tire's sports analytics team is helping sports predict this, and in turn, it shapes Canada's approach to training and competition. I just want to just add the better tool to be the best athlete I can be. I see not only uh, immediate benefits with, with the data that we've been able to see so far, but I would tell you over the next uh, two to six years, it's going to be a, a boom for us. It's one thing to be looking at lots and lots of, of data over you know, multiple world championships or uh, Olympic uh, events, but uh, to see it come together visualized is, is really exciting. Olympic level athletes training to be number one are teaming up with Canadian Tire and own the podium for a competitive edge from an unexpected source. Data. We're talking big data. Well, I'm riding a bike that is packed with sensors that can measure my performance and then compare it to a lot of historical competition. The stuff that really did open my eyes is, is the the work around distance from Olympic medals, so how far people, where people are when they're five years out or six years out or seven years out. This has been extremely exciting for us. Getting us back into a competitive situation is rewarding and going to be a lot of fun. The biggest influence on winning more medals is not 12 to 18 months out from an Olympics, but more like five to eight years out. That's why the bulk of our work is going to be focused on helping our Olympians prepare for Pyeongchang and Tokyo in 2018 and 2020. Well, thanks very much, uh, Paul and Anne. We've got some time for some questions, so uh, um, some familiar language in there relative to what you might have heard this afternoon in terms of evidence-based decision-making and keep, keep a focus on the future and uh, so forth. So uh, are there any questions out there? I've got one while everybody's thinking about it. So are other countries doing the same thing? Uh, is Canada kind of unique in, in sort of big, ugly uh, uh, data and, uh, and big analytics? I can tell you that other, other countries um, are in, they're paying for it. So UK sport is the equivalent of on the podium in Canada and they have a $10 million budget just for UK sport to hire data analytic experts to work within their organization. As I mentioned, we don't have those kind of resources, and hence we look, we've got to solve it. So how do we solve it? We, we form a partnership with someone who can help. So you mentioned, Dan, doing uh, more with the same or less. Again, I think that strikes a familiar tone here in this room. Um, and your relationship with Canadian Tire started about 18 months ago. What did you do before that? Because we had 2010 Olympics where we got the 14. Like, did you do that internally, or like, how did you we how just, did you get going on this? Yeah, we just didn't do it, and it's really been an emerging field, as it has in so many sectors in terms of data analytics. Uh, we knew there were a couple of the nations we were up against where we're starting to invest in this. I think what we've done now in terms of our partnership with Canadian Tire, we, we've really got a competitive competitive advantage now uh, over many countries. So. You know, it, it's all about finding some solutions. And we may not have all the resources inside our organization, and I'm sure that's, that's the same with many of you in the room. So, um, you know, being resourceful and in, in trying to, to find a partner that can help you. And as, as Paul mentioned, there's something in it for them too. I mean, they're a better company through it. Their, their staff are engaged, and mm -hmm. it, it really has been a win-win. So take us back to that sort of fateful meeting with a friend of yours on the board, uh, or from Canada, uh, Canadian Tire on the board. How did that go? I mean, uh, a lot of partnerships start with pre-existing trust. And what's clear here is there's a reciprocity, right? There's a win-win going on. But take us back, Anne, to that, uh, well, that, it was, that day. Well, it, it was, um, I'm sh in any kind of leadership responsibility, you're identifying, well, what, what, are, the, what are your challenges and what is the rest of the world doing? So our, our kind of lens is, is global. And we knew that other nations were getting into the data analytics area of high performance sport, really trying to figure out how to, who, is, who are our future metal potential athletes. And so I shared that uh, to our board and said, well, you know, we need to get into this and we don't have enough, we have to take money away from athletes and coaches to put it into data analytics. And that wasn't a, a, a change that we were prepared to consider at that time. And Duncan sitting at the board table, a senior VP within Canadian Tire, you know, said, I think I can help. And 
off he went, eh, Paul? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah, and uh, for us it was, um, you know, my advice with partnerships, and I'm glad we went this route, was it, it was, we're a big test and learn shop. So we started slow, and we wanted to make sure, we, we did it with existing resources, we didn't have a dedicated team, we just sort of begged, board and stole from existing resources and put some analytics together, it was very organic. But the reception we got was so tremendous that we said, you know what, we need to be more formal about this. And so um, it, it, it was like a dance, right? So it was, you know, are we really gonna be able to deliver what they're expecting? Are they gonna like what we do? Are we gonna get anything out of it? So we started slow, but when the recognition was there that we've got something here that both partners, po both, uh, partners value, we ramped up tremendously quickly. So we've got um, a team of seven full-time people doing this work for us now. And we're working with 10 sports, and we have 20 banging the door down to get involved. Wow. Like we just can't, we could hire 10 more data geeks. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple questions at the back here. Name, please. Sure, hi. Uh, Terry Collins from the BC Ministry of Health. Uh, just curious about your approach and your strategy around building that capacity and capability in your team. I think sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So it looks like you've been very successful in kind of building a team up with this skill set. How did you do that? Yeah, so, you know, we've had a large analytics team at Canadian Tire for many years. I've been there 17 years, um, and I started out as an analyst, so I can relate to a lot of what they go through. Um, and I've got a team of 35 analysts, and under my VP, who you heard speak on the, uh, on the presentation, he's got about 70 analysts, so I have a peer that has about 35 as well. We're big on developing people and letting them rotate through our disciplines. So uh, we have very low turnover at Canadian it's less than 5% in our particular area, so very uh, strong workforce. We have a lot of tenured people, up to 30 years on the team. Um, so we give them challenging work, we keep them engaged, and as I mentioned, this was just another avenue to show um, potential analysts if they're interested, and here's something else you can learn while you're here. Um, so from that perspective, it was not hard for us. What was hard was understanding what matters and doesn't matter when it comes to the sports and wading through, because we're used to talking about things like FICO scores, right? Like that's our world, that's what we deal in, not performance scores and those sorts of things. So learning the lingo, making relationships with the sport organizations. So my manager, Justin, who you also saw in the video there, great relationship with Own the Podium and with each of the sports organizations that we support and really understanding their needs because they're our client at the end of the day. We want to deliver them a product that will be beneficial to them. So great dialogue uh, and understanding what's important in terms of the metrics that they would like to see. Other questions? Everybody? Hi. Right here, yeah, Bill. Paul. Hi, uh, Paul Hebert. I'm from Montreal. Um, just a comment and a question. Uh, the comment was when I heard you describe uh, this for Paul, um, the whole idea that you guys created a data creep tool for PDFs. Yeah. I hope you patented that because I all I kept thinking was, oh my God, we need this in healthcare. Yeah. Unfortunately, we PDF'd everything in a lot of parts of the country. And the, it just, literally blew just, my just saying, yeah, you know? it, it blew my mind when the guy showed me. I this couldn't stuff. believe it so, when I heard yeah, it. Yeah, it really. And did. it really works. Yeah, it does. It's phenomenal. So yeah. okay, that's so. I hope you patented it because I'm <laughs> sure you could probably start a business. Yeah, that would be my retirement that. plan. <laughs> exactly. So, so the comment part is, um, I, I see how your risk prediction and all that. I, I'm a scientist, so I, I get all that. Uh, but um, what, what I wonder about is, are you thinking the next step, which is measuring while you intervene? So you know, doing a researcher, right? So yeah. what about measuring interventions, the next step? Yeah. So you, you can now look at what you predict. Seems to me the cool part would be, well, what if we train this way versus that way? And would that make a difference? No, absolutely, and, and Anne's right. So are you doing that or? Just... We're, we're not yet, we're not looking. Or you're not at... telling, right? Yeah, well, we're not looking <laughs> at much of the physiology side of the business. We can though, so it's definitely on our roadmap. Uh, if, if we can sort of fulfill the demand we have right now for the podium pathway analytics, it's absolutely something else we want to look at in terms of the composition of athletes, their output, their performance, their training, all of that stuff. Um, definitely something we want to look at. Even like there's science around, uh, you know, the swimsuits that they wear in the pool, right? Like it's unbelievable the level and depth of what you can get into. You know, we've got to bite off what we can chew at this moment. Um, we've got a long partnership, so hopefully we'll get at some of that stuff as we start to knock off some of the sports. Other questions? Hi, my David. name is David O'Toole. I'm from Kai High. 
I think it's the same question, Paul. I was going to ask, has the data had an impact on the training regimes leading to more consistency and standardization of behaviors in those? That was the first question. The second question is, do the people who you just buttonholed to be on the podium in a couple of years know that you buttonholed them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so the second question first. So I, I made sure Anne was all right with it when I mentioned these uh, athletes. So I, I'm not sure that they know. They know they're good yeah. athletes. So uh, for any of you that's from Toronto, like you heard all about Andre de, Andre de Grasse last summer, right? So he is the real deal and he will do very well, hopefully, in Rio. Um, so it, it would not come as a surprise, I don't think, to those athletes knowing that we've tapped them to do very well in Rio. Uh, and the first, I, I think we're at such an infancy stage with the analytics that that true feedback, feedback loop has yet to be finalized, to be perfectly honest with you. So we're expecting that. We have yet to go through a full Olympic cycle uh, doing this work. So we've looked at a lot of world championship data, a lot of World Cup data, um, but going through an Olympic cycle will be very helpful for us to see, you know, we've made a lot of predictions, how accurate were they? What it's helping our, the coaches do with uh, their programs is identifying um, the athletes that are at this point tracking for a medal result and how they do from year to year to year. Are they falling off the path a little bit? And if so, then why? And so they're able to, um, they're able to have conversations from a technical perspective that might look at physio physiology or technique or uh, mental performance, strengthening, um, all the attributes that go into winning a medal, uh, which are sport specific. But now the coaches have, and the high performance directors have a much richer uh, knowledge base by which to uh, look at the actual training uh, program that they're implementing for the athletes. Sure, uh, another question. Sheila Maloney from Canada Health InfoWay. Um, <clears throat> Bill's mentioned there's a lot of parallels to some of the data analytics and some of the things that we're facing in healthcare, and I'm wondering if you can comment on two things. One is um, access to the information. You said you've got lots of big data. Any issues around privacy or getting the information? Um, and then the second uh, question is around supporters, and, and you know, I'm, if a coach is gung-ho on athlete B and you're telling them, no, pay attention to athlete A, who, who are your detractors and, and why, and who are your biggest supporters? I wonder if you can comment on that. Uh, on, on the data side, it, you know, we, we got our data basically from public sources. So a lot of the data is on the web and it's from the sports associations or from the, the international sports associations that those sports belong to. So we don't just analyze Canadian data, we'll analyze worldwide data if we have it available to us. Um, and some of it, quite frankly, is really grassroots. I think it's skating, but I'm not sure. It might be swimming. There's a guy in Toronto that's like swimming mad, and he's got his own database. And so we, and it's out there for everybody to look at, and he captures every event, and we scraped it all off, right? So it's out in the public domain. Um, w one of the things we're concentrating on, though, is making sure we have good structure around our data. So we partner with a, a big data company called Axiom, and we have all of our data storage at Axiom. And they've, quite frankly, hopped on this wagon, too, with us and donated $50,000 worth of space and capacity for us to store this data, which is fantastic. Um, so from a privacy perspective, I don't think so, because we basically tapped public sources. Um, the, the tools that are being developed, though, are quite... Um, you know, they're, uh, they're huge difference makers for other nations. So, um, so Paul's team, like they developed a practical tool for swimming to be able to say, in this particular sport, it's gonna take, this is gonna be the record winning time. So Paul just said, there'll be seven world records broken in Rio. He's done that, he, they've also provided Swimming Canada with a tool that is able to say, you know, uh, Joe Smith at this age needs to be going this fast in order to be on the podium eight years from now. So swimming's able to use their own database or this information to really use it in a very practical sense. So that's the real value for the National Sport Organization. Our challenge, however, is we've got coaches that are being poached by other nations. And so, you know, they are, they're able to, um, we, don't, we have less control than we would like around access that those coaches can have when they go to compete or uh, move to another nation to be able to say, oh, you should see what Canada's doing around data analytics. So, um, 
it, it's a real challenge for us as a country, and I'm not sure any country's really uh, solved that one yet because it is such a volatile um, uh, poaching of, uh, of good coaches and technical leaders from one nation to another. So that's a tough one for us. Michael, back in the corner. Thanks. This isn't so much about privacy, but maybe an open data type question. Uh, if I understand correctly, there, there, maybe I'm oversimplifying, there's two steps to the analytics. One is, once you've gotten all this publicly available data, is cleaning it up and putting it in a, a nice analysis-ready form. And then the second is running the statistical analyses, predictive analytics, whatever you want to call it. What is your take, it sounds like, on the pros and cons of making the stuff from the first step open, publicly available? Because there's lots of folks who like to run statistical analyses. There's a, a whole section of the American Statistical Association uh, that does sports statistics. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people who would love to do that. It would seem to me one downside is you lose the competitive advantage of the investment in the cleaning the data, but the upside would be that you open up the, you know, to a much broader group of people to see about what kind of innovative ideas for the uh, statistical analysis, the predictive analytics. What, what I would say to that is it, it's not as easy as just running a bunch of stats on a data set. We're actually creating models and we're creating um, predictions. So uh, to your point, anyone can do that. Uh, I'm not sure anyone's going to invest the time and effort of having seven full-time people working on it like we did. You might want to do it in your basement if you're a geek. Um, so other people can do it. They're going to have a different take on it than we will have on it. So we built proprietary ways that we'll look at this data. And if you get another group of seven people together, they will look at it differently. They might be better at it than we are. But um, we think we've done some really interesting way, uh, predictions on ways to look at performance when it comes to that data. And it's, it's tying the data together as well. So just because the data is available, it's not like it's all in one spot. So I've got to take data from here and triangulate it with data from here and from here, and I'm bringing it all together. And there is some data that the sports organizations give us that is not publicly available. So there is a lot of public data, but there is some that the sports organizations give us. I had one other question, and then we'll let you go, I think. Uh, you talked a lot about individual performance indicators. Healthcare is kind of a team sport, uh, like volleyball or hockey or, or uh, basketball. How do you? How does your data analytics work when you're when you're mixing a team or trying to to ice the best team? Right. Yeah, I, I would say we haven't crossed the realm of team dynamics or composition yet. We've looked at how a team needs. It, it really is the same analysis at the end of the day. How does a team need to perform relative to other teams? So whether we're looking at track pursuit uh, in cycling or we're looking at rowing with the big boats, uh, it's the same sort of methodologies that apply. So we'll look at and we'll dissect the race and say, how did that team win that race? Did they have a lead all the way through? Did they save it for the end? Did they kill the competition in every race that they were in? So the same sort of methodologies and approaches apply, whether it's a team or an individual sport. Well, again, on behalf of everybody in the room, we want to thank you for giving us some insights on, on the podium. Uh, maybe this will be the day that we start to begin to own the podium again in health and healthcare as the best performing healthcare nation in the world. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.